We've been talking in this series, the Christmas story about, we've, Chris Campbell started us off on the story of promise out of Matthew chapter one, verses one through 18, 17 maybe. And then uh, last week we looked at the story of love, verses 18 through 25 of chapter one. And today we hit chapter two, verses one through 12. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've learned about Christmas stories is we get a lot of bad theology from our Christmas carols. <laughs> How many kings were there? Wise men that went and visited the babe? Anybody know? Well, we say there's three, don't we? But we really don't know. And are they wise guys? I mean, I'm mean, not like wise guys, but wise men or magi or astrologers, astrologers or who are these guys? Uh, you know, I think of that song, Away in the Manger, of which is maybe one of my least favorite Christmas carols. I know, I know. But I can, I can assure you, and some of you with brand new babies around here can assure you of this as well. That baby was not sleeping if the cattle were lowing in that place. The cattle woke everything up. I would encourage, I asked someone this week, I think it was, it was Jim, Pastor Jim, I asked him, I said, what did, uh, what did the innkeeper say to Mary and Joseph when they got there? Anybody know what the innkeeper said? Who says the innkeeper said there's no room in the inn? Anybody in the room say that? The text does not say that. The innkeeper didn't say a thing. The text just tells us there was no room in the inn. So watch your theology on some of these Christmas carols, but I diverge. We got to get back to the text this morning. One of the things that I, I love to do if I go into people's homes and they've got their nativity sets out and they have them wrong with the wise men in the nativity set, I like to move them. So just, just prepare yourself. If I come visit, stuff the wise men in a closet, all right? They can come out later. Here's what I like about these guys. They, what you find in Matthew 2 is they respond with this extravagant praise and worship and joy. And our struggle is, is we're so familiar, aren't we? It's the Christmas story again. It's Matthew 1, it's Luke 2, and we have lots of other passages we can go to, but those seem to be the predominant ones. But when you come back to Matthew 2 and you settle in here for a moment, you see a little phrase in verse 10 that says, they were overwhelmed with joy. And then in verse 11, they offered their gifts and they worshiped the child there. I think worship and praise and sacrifice is the only proper response to the birth of a Savior. Do you agree with me this morning? Is it the only proper response? I believe it is. And here's my struggle is, why don't we do it? Why do we catch ourselves struggling with Christmas carols? And Because here's what I, th I find about most people with Christmas carols. You either love them and love to sing them, or they're just not your favorite. But there's not many people in the middle on Christmas songs. But why is it at the birth of a newborn son, of a king of kings, of a lord of lords, of a savior, of the Emmanuel, the God with us, that we can go, yeah, but Christmas just isn't my thing. And I talk to people on a regular basis that for them, Christmas is not the most wonderful time of the year. And I get it. Sometimes Christmas marks holidays of of a family member's passing, of a broken heart. Sometimes it marks memories of a difficult childhood or a painful marriage. And we could go on down that list of which I won't go today. But is, not, is it not true that Satan is wise enough to gather us at the most wonderful time of the year, this Christmas season, and he does his best work to try to steal our joy at this time of the year? We get overwhelmed, we, go, we are overspent, our schedules are too full, our hearts are not prepared, 
Our focus is not right. And what some of you even in the room today are thinking, one more week. The count day for you, the countdown for you is not when Christmas gets here, it's when Christmas is over. And while I understand that today, I think there's a better way. Matter of fact, I think this passage teaches us there's a better way. So here's our big idea. A central truth that I give to you this morning that anything other than Jesus will not take you the full distance of joy. If we're going to talk about joy this morning, if you and I get caught up in the hustle and bustle of the season, of the gift exchange, of the great food, of all the wonderful candy, and the other things that we have at this holiday season, anything, anything other than Jesus will never take you to the full distance of joy. And that's not just at Christmas, that's year round. When you get Jesus right, you'll get everything else right. So let me talk to you today about how we experience joy. And we're going to move quickly down through this passage. I preached on this passage just two weeks ago in Virginia. And when I had gone back to visit with our, our former church, the pastor there asked me to speak out of Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I thought, well, how handy. I'm already going to speak about that in a couple of weeks. And then he said, now I want you to speak about jealousy out of that passage. And I went, well, I'm speaking about joy out of that passage. He said, no, you got to speak about jealousy out of Matthew chapter two. And you know what? It's there. It's there. Oftentimes, jealousy is the opposite of joy. Oftentimes, we get these things turned around. Can I read the passage with us and then come back and talk about it? Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And they were saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and we have come to worship him. Now, when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes and the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. When well, Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And then they go to quote verse six, and you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time that the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. And after hearing the king, they went on their way and there it was the star they had seen at its rising and it led them until they had came and stopped until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy and entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. So let's take this thing in bite-sized pieces today. If you want to experience joy today, number one, out of verses one and two, I want you to learn how to seek the only one that matters. Seek the only one that matters. You notice when you look at verses 1 and 2, it'll be on the, on the screen beside me. It's on your handout. I hope you have your Bible with you after Jesus was born. So now this is a period of time. We know that they, they show up to the house and there's a child there, not a babe. So this is a period of time. We're thinking anywhere from 18 to 24 months after Jesus was born, these wise men came and asked King Herod when they got into Jerusalem, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And circle the word for. Why are they asking about this king of the Jews? It's because they saw his star and they, underline it, they came to worship him. Why did you come to church today? Because that's what you do on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock? Because that's our task? 
Because if you're a Christian, you're supposed to go to church. We're privileged to have Sue's daddy here with us this weekend. And uh, he and I were talking the other day. Barry, he lives in Winter Haven, Florida. Lucky. Um, but we were talking about going to church and I made a state to, statement to him. And I understand Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But here's what I believe this morning, church. God really isn't all that interested of you as a Christ follower in church first. He's interested if you're in church to worship him only. Coming to church won't secure your worship. So coming to church won't, won't guarantee that you will be here with the right frame of mind and the right focus and the right purpose. The wise men teach us a couple lessons here. They see his star. They journey after him. Be why? Because they wanted to worship him. Now, here's what we know about these guys. Most likely, they're astrologers. And most likely, there was more than three of them. Three dudes walking into Jerusalem is not going to cause much of a stir. A group of people walking into Jerusalem is going to call it a great stir. Three people probably won't get an audience before King Herod, but many most likely would. It appears that they have traveled for some time upwards of two years. Why would you travel anywhere for two years? Can you imagine traveling with your preschoolers in the car for two years? Are we there yet? wonder how many times they got lost. Turn here, turn there, do th Listen, traveling anywhere is difficult. These guys were focused to journey for two years up to that. To me, that shows great devotion. That shows great determination. That shows that they were on a mission to do something specifically. What did they want to do? It says it there at the end of verse two. We want to worship him. And here's the reality, folks. Every decision you and I make, every one of our choices, and every one of our movements reflect what you and I believe will bring us the greatest joy. Now, let me say it again. Everything you and I do, all of our decisions, our choices, and our movements reflect what we really think will bring the greatest joy. If you're more committed to your job than your family, it's because you think your job and success and fame and fortune maybe is what will bring you the greatest joy. If you're committed, more committed to your family than you are to your Lord because you think that a earthly relationship is more important than a heavenly relationship. Am I preaching here? Are you hearing this this morning? I wrote that statement down a couple of weeks ago and I had to come back and ponder and ask myself, what is it that I do on a regular basis that I am pursuing with more energy and more passion and with really the intent of having greater joy than a one-on-one -on -one and personal and daily and intimate relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm just gonna press this out here to us this morning that you and I are always pressing, we're always journeying towards our pleasure and God's not upset about that. Matter of fact, he says he'll give us the desires of our heart, doesn't he? But what should come first? Years and years ago, back in the 70s, my pastor, Dr. Falwell, came out with these little gold lapel pins. Some of you may have even gotten some of these that simply said, Jesus first. It's just a simple reminder who, who, of who needs to have first place in our life, of our priorities. And can I just ask you today, are you seeking the only one that matters more than anything else. More than relationships, more than money, more than fame, more than success. And the truth is, the Lord made you and I to be satisfied. He made you and I to delight in certain things. But our delight, as the psalmist would tell us, 
is in the Lord. Our delight is the one who walks in his word. And I think this is the time of the year that it's easy to magnify so many other things that capture our attention and where we pursue our pleasures. And can I just encourage us today? Just start today. Lord, I want to get this season right. And I want to pursue you first. I want to be like the wise men. Tell me where this king of the Jews is so we can worship him there. Let me give you a second one. You're going to have to learn how to resist anything and everything that steals your joy. Lou, when you look at verse 3, it says, When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him, with, with him. If you circle that phrase, deeply disturbed, the literal translation of this is that he threw, uh -huh, flew into a rage. Now, Herod is one, as known as one of the meanest uh, kings, rulers, authorities that we have in all of Scripture. He was always jealous of someone wanting to take his throne. Now, he had been appointed by a Roman ruler to serve over this area. He's not a Jew. This isn't his people. He's just the ruler of that region, but he's scared to death that someone is going to take over his throne. He is known as a crazy madman. He had 10 wives. Crazy madman, right? One Roman leader said, and I thought this statement was so amazing. He said, it is better to be King Herod's pig than to be his son. Herod had a couple of his wives and a couple of his children murdered because he thought they were after his throne. Well, catch this this group of wise guys show up and go, hey, where's this king of the Jews that's been born? And he goes berserk. He loses his mind because this king of the Jews can only mean there's someone out there who's ready to take over his spot. And then did you see where it says, and all Jerusalem with him? Do you know why all Jerusalem was upset? Because if Herod's upset, well, you know how the saying goes, don't you? If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If King Herod's not happy, all of society is in an uproar. And everyone is nervous about what could happen next. So when I say resist anything that would steal your joy, you've got to go back and unpack this. And I really can't unpack it for you. I can give you some suggestions. I can give you a few things. Is it, is it safe to say that suffering can steal joy? In this world, we'll have troubles and trials. Does anybody in the room, talk to me, does anybody in the room know anything about suffering today? Has anybody had a loss? Has anybody had a pain? Is anybody just in a moment of crisis of faith even where we suffer? And suffering can steal joy. And yet James comes along and says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Did you see what that said? Count it all joy. I've told you this already, and I'll tell you many times in the days ahead, as long as the Lord lets me be your pastor. Happiness will come from things, but joy only comes from the Lord. It is possible for us to have suffering and sorrow and joy at the same time. We can suffer and we can mourn a loss here. 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that we grieve, but not as those without hope. Can we have grief? Yes, we have grief. We must have grief. But we also as Christ followers must have hope. Let me try this one on for you this morning. How about conflict? Anybody in the room ever had conflict? You all are not telling the truth today. You know why some of you don't go to family Christmas parties? Conflict or suffering. Either way, you can apply whichever one fits. And yet Philippians says, complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. Can you have conflict with people? Yes. Matter of fact, Scripture says, as much as it depends on you, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. 
If it's at all possible, live peaceably with them. You know what that verse tells us? There are some people that are just going to be cantankerous all the time that aren't going to allow you to live peaceably with him. But according to you, you can live as peaceably as possible with them. And you can remove conflict. What about pressure? Oh my goodness, Christmas. It's the performance and it's the deadlines and it's the obligations and it's the responsibilities. Anybody else exhausted yet? Just trying to get to Christmas? And yet in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and what? I will give you rest. I find busyness to be a real opportunity to steal my joy. When I meet people and I ask them how they're doing, you know what the number one response is I get from people? Busy. It used to be fine. Now I get busy. We're just busy. I just got so, I'm just so busy. And you know how the little song goes, don't you? Parties for hosting, marshmallows for roasting. That's all a good idea unless you have a party to plan and no marshmallows to roast. And then it creates all this conflict and struggle and pressure and busyness. And 1 Corinthians says, so whatever you eat or drink and whatever you do, do everything. Circle, pay attention to it, everything to the glory of the Lord. Why? So that it doesn't steal your joy. Someone has said Christmas really is the most wonderful time of the year if you can survive it. You know what really steals your joy this morning? Flat out sin. Some of us have walked into this room today and we're just holding on to stuff. Habits, hurts, and hangups. And we don't want to let it go. We're not going to confess it. We're not going to get over it. We're not going to stop it. We just want to hold on to it. And sin will always steal your joy, Christ follower. Those of you that profess the name of Christ, it will always steal your joy. And Jesus said in John 15, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. If you're going to have joy, you're going to have to remain in him. And if you're going to remain in him, you're going to have to have obedience to what he's asked you to do. You're going to have to have an abiding relationship, which requires obedience to what he said do and don't do. Does that make sense? Write this down. The simple summation of everything I just gave you there is any unsurrendered area in my life will steal my joy. Any unsurrendered area in my life will always steal my joy. Let me give you a, a third one. If you are, are struggling to have joy this morning, then I'm going to teach you how to learn to avoid, avoid indifference to the word of God. Did you catch what Herod did? These wise guys show up. Where's this, this babe born king of the Jews? He throws it, goes into a fit. He doesn't know. He did not know that a, a king of the Jews was on his way. He didn't realize the 700 prophecies. So he runs off and he asks the priest and the scribes. Now to understand those guys, the chief priest, they represent the Jewish worship of the area. The scribe represent the Jewish law. So he goes to the religious leaders and the political leaders. And he says, where's this king of the Jews supposed to be born? And I find it so interesting. Their response is simply in Judea, in Bethlehem. Because this was what was written by the prophet. And then they, they give us this quote of an Old Testament passage. Do you realize this morning that it's very possible to have knowledge of the word of God and not be transformed by the power of the word of God. These guys knew exactly where the king of Jews was supposed to be born, but it made no difference to them. 
Matter of fact, this king, this babe, has been born now for several months, up to two years, and none of these guys have traveled to Bethlehem to visit and to worship this babe. You know why? They were completely indifferent with the word of God. And here's the truth today. You and I can know the text and miss the point. We can know the story and miss the Savior. We can know all about everything that's happening here. But it never be internalized and never be processed and never be real in our life. And here's the truth. Indifference to the word of God. Hear me. Pay close attention. Indifference to the word of God will eventually move you to opposition to the will of God. If you and I are indifferent to the word of God, we will become in opposition to the will of God. And here's another truth. Christ follower, you're never neutral and you're never standing still. You're not plateaued. You're either moving closer to being like him or farther away. You're drawing into relationship with him or you're pushing back. But you and I are never standing still in our walk with Christ. So here's the evaluation this morning. Here's your metric. Are you getting closer to him this morning or are you backing up? I love the old story and I can't remember what I've told you and what I haven't. So I just act like it's the first time I'm telling you. But do you, anybody in here remember uh, back in the day when there was the bench seat in the car? The, the, without that center console. You know what was great about the bench seat in a car? The girlfriend could sit beside you. There's wisdom right there. If I go buy a new car, I'm praying it has a bench seat. You remember when you'd go out on those dates and you'd put on that little come hither, stay closer? Try to smell right so she would scoot over across that bench and sit. I, I had a 1966 Chevy Impala Super Sport with a 427 in it. Mm. And I felt like a king of the world driving down the road in that baby blue Impala with my girlfriend sitting right beside me. Am I telling the truth this morning? Story goes that the old couple was driving down the road and they had been married for quite some time and she was sitting next to the window and he was still in his spot behind the wheel and she asked him one day, she said, honey, why, why don't we sit close together anymore? And he said, I'm not the one that moved. <laughs> why don't I feel close to the Lord anymore? He's not the one that moved. He's not the one that moved. Are you drawing towards him or further away from him this morning? I love this next point. When you look at verses seven through nine, Herod, he's such a scoundrel. He secretly summoned the wise man and he asked them the exact time the star appeared. Why do you think he wanted to know the exact time? So he could know how old this baby was. He sent them to Bethlehem. How would he know to send them to Bethlehem? Because somebody had told him. He didn't know that of himself. He hadn't read it. He said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Stop right there for a moment. The right response of Herod was not go and find the child and then come back and tell me, so then I can go wor worship. You know what the right response should have been? Let me go with you. Let me go with you to worship this child. But that was never in his heart. There was nothing about him that wanted to do that. And it says after in verse 9, after hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star that they had seen at its rising. And it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. Here's the point I want you to get. Always learn how to journey towards Jesus. If you want to have joy this morning, journey towards Jesus. Say that with me. Journey towards Jesus. And here's the reality. It's always easier to pursue lesser joys, isn't it? 
It's always easy to get distracted and pursue lesser stuff. To pursue things that we think maybe will get our, our life to align just right. I had to have my truck aligned the other day. You know how I, I knew I needed a front end alignment? Because when I was going down the road holding the steering wheel, it was this way. And I was still going straight. I needed an alignment. How's your alignment this morning, church? How are you doing this morning? Are you journeying towards Jesus? Joy is not going to be found in the pleasures of this life and of this world. It's not a problem that we pursue them. It's the problem is when we pursue them ahead of Christ, as greater importance to Christ. Here's what I like about these wise men. They're following this star and they've been doing it for two years and they get to Jerusalem and they stop and ask, where's this king born, this child born king of the Jews? And then they go to Bethlehem. He wasn't in Jerusalem. He wasn't in Bethlehem. And then they continued to follow until they got to the house where the child was. Some of us are only getting halfway home. Some of us are only journeying so far. C.S. Lewis, the great writer, said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with lesser things when infinite joy is offered. We are simply far too easily pleased. We stop short of the joy that God offers. We stop short of getting all the way home. We dabble in this and we dabble in that and we miss joy completely. Can you imagine if, if I tell Sue I'm coming home and I leave, I leave my office here and I get in my truck and, and I go home, towards home, I get on 50 and I, I head out, out of town and I, I get to, well, let's just do it this way. I get to the t and L, <laughs> And I stop. Have I made it home? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm headed that way. Did I get home? But I'm on the right route. Did I get home? No, I stopped too short. Well, let's say I, by God's grace and mercy, I bypass the TNL. And I go further out and I actually get to my, my development. And as I turn right into my development, the base of the hill, I, I just stop and I call Sue and I go, I'm home. Am I home? I'm in the development. I'm in the same neighborhood, but I'm still not home, am I? Watch it, I go up the hill and I, I make my right and I get to the very next road and I, I make my left and I know that my house is the second house down the hill on the right and I get to the top of my hill and I call out to Sue and I, I text her, I call her on the phone and go, honey, I'm home. I'm still not home, am I? I've journeyed. I've moved from one place to another I've gotten closer, but I'm still not there. Maybe I even go down the hill and I turn into my, my driveway and I sit in front of my house and I turn the key off. Am I home? I'm not home until I'm in her presence and sitting outside in the truck stopped too short. Are you home this morning? You got out of the car. You made it to the church parking lot. Matter of fact, you all did really good. You got out of your cars and came in the building. So proud of you. Are you home? Have you journeyed all the way to Jesus? 
Because only Jesus, only Jesus will take you the full distance to joy. And look what happens. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. And entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Folks, if you want to have joy today, if you want to know that you have joy today, if you want your joy to be complete and overflowing today, you'll know it when your joy overflows into worship. If your joy can stay contained, it's not full yet. If your joy is that I can, I, I enjoyed going to church today, but it hasn't changed the one, changed you to worship the only one that matters authentically, then you've not experienced joy. If your joy does not push you to journeying all the way towards Christ, then you've not experienced the fullness and the overflow of joy. I wish I had a cup here with me this morning. Do you know how you know when a cup is full? You know how my kids knew, thought they knew when a cup was full? My kids just used to love to pour a glass of milk and I would watch them. They would sit on the t at there at the, the table and they would pour it until it got that little bubble on the top. You know what I'm talking about? They could watch it. Was it full when it had the bubble? It wasn't full until one more drop caused it to flow over. Until what was inside the cup touched what was around the cup. Joy is not full until what is inside your heart overflows and touches the people around you. Your joy is not full unless it is overflowing in your worship to the king. Does that make sense? Too many of us, we're content with our glass being half full. Too many of you are fussing that your glass is half empty. Too many of you are just asking who drank my water. The reality is, I want full and overflowing joy. Anybody else in the room? I want it to full up my, fill up my life to the point that it touches everything around me. That it overflows and it makes a difference. And I'll tell you how you know when your joy is making a difference in your life. It's a very simple principle that comes out of verse 12. Easily missed, I think. It says, in being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country a different route. When your joy is full, you will follow through in obedience. What the Lord asks you and I to do will matter. And here's a great principle. There will never be authentic worship when willful disobedience is practiced. I'll say it again. You and, I, you and I will never have authentic worship to the only one that matters and journey all the way towards Christ and have exceeding joy in worshiping him if there is willful disobedience to what he's asked you and I to do. Because worshiping Jesus changes our direction. And you never go back the same way you came. You're always different. I hate these glasses. If I've got them on, I can see my notes, but I can't see you. Take them off. I can see you. Can't see my notes. It all depends on who I want to look at. Okay. I just wonder if some of us are unlike the wise men this morning. I wonder who in the room today is not following their practice. And we've only journeyed part way. We're not following all the way through 
to where the child is, to where the Savior is, to where the King is, to where the Lord is. You go, how do I know if I'm just part way? How do I know if I'm not fully committed and fully devoted? Is it possible today that you have seen his star and you've gotten close to the house but you've never come in and worshiped the king for some of you today and I don't know who you are I don't know where you are but I believe there are people in this room today that simply need to meet Jesus for the very first time I'm not asking you do you know the Christmas story I'm not asking you what you know about the wise men. I'm asking you, are you seeking after the one born king of the Jews so that you may worship him? Do you know him today? And would you like to? I hope so. This morning at a very early hour, I walked through every one of these rows, as is my custom. And I put my hand on every one of these chairs, as is my custom. Not because I have anything unique about me. I'm just here as one, the old man said, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. That's all I am. But I prayed for where you're sitting today. I prayed for you today that you would meet Jesus here and that you would give your life to him. That you would take an opportunity in a time just like this where you would make a couple confessions. One, that you know that you're a sinner. Two, that you know you need a savior. And three, that you can't do it on your own. Pretty simple, isn't it? All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. That means you and I. But the most famous verse of all the scripture for God so loved the world, for God so loved me that he gave his only son so that I would not perish but have everlasting life. And he says in John, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the Lord, then you will be saved. Right where you sit this morning at this very time, would you just, would you just pray out to the Lord with your own words, Lord, I am a sinner and I need a savior. Would you do for me today what I cannot do for myself? Would you pray that? You know, you go, well, he didn't ask me to close my eyes. It's not about the posture of your head or the position of your eyes. It's about your heart before him. Will you journey today for the very first time all the way to joy? All the way to salvation, all the way to forgiveness. I don't normally do it this way. But if you prayed that prayer today and you were serious and you meant it and you know today that when I prayed and asked God to forgive me, he did that. I believe what the scripture says. If you prayed that for the very first time today, just raise your hand. I'm, you don't have to stand up and shout. Just, just raise your hand. I, this church wants to know. Anybody in this room today? Yeah. Some of you are sitting here going, my head itches, but I'm afraid to... Some of you in the room, you're like me and you met Jesus a long time ago as a child. Maybe you met him as a young adult. Maybe not too long ago you've surrendered your life to him. You met him, and you know him. And if you died today, heaven would be your home. But for whatever reason, you stopped short of continuing to grow and develop and be discipled and look like him. I 
you got a great opportunity today to do the exact same thing I asked a few moments ago and go, Lord, I can't do this on my own. Anybody in the room? I can't do this on my own. I've got to have your grace and mercy. I've got to have your spirit within me working and changing and transforming me. Anybody in the room go, Lord, I've just been distracted. I've gotten busy. I've gotten discouraged. I've been a little bit overwhelmed. My heart's hurt. I've been wounded. Am I talking to anybody in the room today? And there have been some things, Father, that have happened in my life that have caused me to just stop short of continuing to walk with you. And I'll tell you how you'll know it. Because your joy is not overflowing. Because what you say you have on the inside doesn't show up on the outside. Can I just beg us this morning wherever we are and whatever this looks like for the remaining of our time together, that we get before the Lord and go, Lord, walk with me all the way. I don't want to stop. Anybody in the room? I don't want to stop. I want to get to the end of the day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. Let's have a party. Some of you are going to have to start walking again. Linger in prayer. Study the word. Find that place of service. Share the good news of the gospel. Walk a gift around the corner. And watch what God does. These gift baskets we're giving out, they're as much about what God, what God wants to do in us as they are about what God wants to do with the person receiving the gift. Hey, church, let's just do it. Want to? I'm wrapping up, I promise. Anybody ever played poker? <laughs> you, you admitted it in church, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I've never played poker. But I understand this, and some of you can help me with this. There's a point in a poker game they say, I've seen enough movies, where you got all these chips in front of you and you take all of these chips and you push them into the center of the table. What's the phrase? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Two people admit they've played poker and 120 people know exactly what I'm talking about. These altars will be open in just a moment. You're welcome to come forward at any given time. We saw it in a movie. Gotcha. Hey, folks, what happens today if you take all, all of your life, the joys, the pains, the hurts, the sufferings, the difficulties and the setbacks, if you take it all, you push it across the table before the Lord and you just go to him today, I'm all in. Anybody? I'm all in. Oh, Father, today may it happen. May it happen for your glory and for our good. May it happen because this is your divine will. May it happen because this advances your kingdom and this changes our life and this gives you the, the greatest glory. May it happen in our lives today because you desire that we look and act like you so that we're changed by you and that the people around us are drawn to you. Lord, we say today with a collective voice, may we be all in. Overwhelmed with joy and celebrating the only one that matters. In Jesus' name, amen.